Come on, Zion. Hallelujah. We give God praise this morning. God is awesome. He's real. He's present. He's awesome. Hallelujah. I want to be faithful to my assignment this morning. And there's some things that I believe God wants to share with us. He's ministered to my heart. And today I just want to be free. I feel freedom in the house. I'm going to flow with the Holy Spirit this morning. I'm not here out of routine. I'm not here out of a tradition. I'm here because I want to be faithful to the calling. And I want to be faithful to my assignment, amen. So I'm going to ask that you take a seat this morning, amen. Take a seat. I'm going to take my time, but I'm also going to be timely. All right. Take my time, but I want to be timely. Hallelujah. Sometimes you just got to be still and wait. Don't be in a rush. Don't be in a hurry. Because in haste, you might miss your moment. And it's not by accident that you're here this morning. It's not a routine. And it's important to know that. I want you to go to Isaiah 29. This is in my foundational text. This is the sentiment of my heart. Isaiah 29 and 13. It's not my text that I'm going to be preaching from this morning. But this is the sentiment of my heart. And God confirmed it when Sister Dion was praying this morning and then with the confession of faith and some lyrics to the songs that were sung. God whispered me when I was sitting there, he said, you know, one of the things that is really impacting not just you, but the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, is the danger and the snare of routine. The danger and the snare of routine. Now take a look at you. Go ahead, have a seat, guys. I know it's our customary, and I appreciate everyone respecting and standing for the reading of the word, but I want to make sure I take my time and be obedient and get it all out, what God has placed in me this morning. So this is the sentiment of our approach to worship and why I say the Lord said the dangers and the snares of routine. Isaiah 29 and 13, it says here, therefore the Lord said, Look at this. In as much as these people draw near me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me. In as much tells me that God is watching. He's counting. He collects your tears. He knows how many hairs are on your head. And he's examining, weighing, measuring your worship and your heart. Are you geographically here, but spiritually elsewhere? In as much means you've been learned, you've been taught, you know the way that you should take because it's formulaic, it's routine. We go to church, we go to Bible study, we praise, we dance, we shout. The Pharisees did that. The Sadducees did that. The Spirit says, the Scripture says, he desires truth in the inward parts. The, the, the extra stuff is extra. If your heart really isn't in it, your partial worship, your incomplete, that, that doesn't work for him. Now, he's a loving God. Every 
every day you wake up and there's an opportunity with oxygen in your, your lungs are functioning, your mind, you're in your right mind. You can think, you can create, you can move, you can plan, you can make calls, you can go to work. You can do all of these things. But I don't want to be so caught up in doing all of these things and getting carried away in, the, in the, just the ongoings of life that I, I lose my fervor. I lose the intensity to which I approach God, the sincerity of my heart. You can know all of the scriptures in the Bible. Doesn't mean you're close to God. You can have titles and be in a position of power and have influence. It does not mean you have intimacy with God. Do you want intimacy with God? How bad is your desire? Are you willing to push aside your agenda? What you want? Your right to be right? Are we willing to set aside our own self to provide a godly response to somebody who we know is trifling? When you know they're treacherous, and when you know they don't mean you any good and they're setting up snaps and chairs for you and there's opposition on every side, are you still going to choose to provide a godly response? Or do you want to be gratified by responding in your flesh? You want to be quick to turn up and snap and pop off, right? Because you think it feels good in the moment. But how does that reconcile with the image and the likeness of God? The spirit wouldn't give us any fruit if we didn't need it. If we was able to produce the fruit on our own, God, we don't need God. We don't need the spirit for joy. We don't need the spirit for long suffering and patience and peace and endurance. If we had the wherewithal, why do we need him? It's in those moments where we're being tested and we're being tried. It's in God is watching the heart and how we're responding. And so... I don't want us, me, and I'm not preaching at you, baby, because I'm going to be truthful and I'm going to be transparent. And I know I don't have it all together. <laughs> and I'm not going to pretend to. But what I will do is I'll keep on pursuing. If I fall, I'll get back up again. If I surround myself with like-minded people, I won't be braggadocious and egotistical and arrogant like I'm this and I'm that when I'm just this Okay, my best day, my righteousness is as filthy rags. So I'm not going to come up in here and act like because the choir ain't singing a song or a new song or the song that I don't like or the preacher ain't the preacher that I like or whatever the case may be. I don't care. You know what I care about? Getting close to God. And what does it require of me to get close to him? I don't got time to look at my brothers and my sisters and their deficiencies because I got my own issues. And if I don't get my issues right, then I'm not a chosen vessel to be up here pouring out, faking and pretending and shucking and ducking. I'm not doing any of that. So check your heart. Because this is what God is doing in me. I'm preaching to myself this morning. Because I know what it's like to get caught up in the routine. Things growing stale and mundane. And at the beginning of the year, one thing that God put in my heart was going back to the basics. The basics is enough. Because we get caught up in all kinds of stuff that's still of our attention and our focus. And we just need the basics. The simple fundamentals of living out this truth that's what should take our focus that should be the objectives for each and every one of us that are part of the family of God this morning so if you came to be comfortable if you didn't come to be challenged if you didn't come with the open heart and the open mind to God what do you want to say help me to consider my way because we can sometimes think, again, we don't have no flaws. I'm sanctified. 
I'm saved. I'm filled up with the Holy Ghost. I've been saved since 1982. So what? What does that matter? <laughs> it doesn't matter anything. Okay? Not a one bit. What matters is being close to God. So this is what, again, I just wanted you to know the sentiment of my heart and how I'm approaching this. Because I feel like I'm in a transition. And I just want to make sure that everything I do is, is right and it's pleasing in the sight of the Lord. When I come here, stand before the people of God. Or when you come into the presence of the people of God. Because we all got things that we need God to step in and intervene and demonstrate his power. And show up on time like he always do. To remind us of how faithful and how gracious he's been. That he's drawn us with love and cords of bands, right? He's drawn us with love and kindness and tender mercies. And they're new for us on every morning. Every single morning. So this is the sentiment of where I'm at. I just wanted you guys to know that as a preface. And now I'm going to go to my text, which is found in Genesis. Again, please remain seated. I got about 11 scriptures. And I'm trying to do this in 20 to 25 minutes, about 11 scriptures. It's a very familiar passage. We all know this narrative is Genesis 3. We all have read this. I want to give honor to the Lord. Thank you, God, for giving me this opportunity to stand before your people this morning. Thank you for putting into the heart of the man of God to call on my name. I don't take it lightly, God, and I want to be faithful and pleasing in your sight. So please move upon your servant, oh God, move me out of the way and speak, Lord. I want to give honor to the man of God. Thank you, Bishop. Love you. I'm glad to be home. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. And I also want to give honor to the elders, the ministers, the deacon, the people of God in your respective places, making contributions and pursuing and being faithful to the call, giving of your time, your talent, your resources, your energy, and investing it into the people of God, into the kingdom of God, and what we're trying to build. So I'm thankful to be a part of a like-minded people here. I thank God that I was born in this church. I was built in this church. God has just done a lot of things through this ministry in my life, and it means a lot as a, you know, impressionable young man when I came here at 19, 20 years old. Me and Jesse, I want to give uh, honor to my wife. Amen. The best wife. She keeps me in check. She keeps me on target, on time. I appreciate my wife. She's my help me. She really, really is. And I thank you for all of the sacrifices, everything that you do. You're a remarkable woman, and you're a really, really model, model woman. Amen. So I thank God for that. So my scripture is found in chapter 3. I'm going to read these verses in your hearing. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, a free, or pardon me, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of it fruit and ate and also gave to her husband with her and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And look at how God responds. He heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? And I'm going to drop down to verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. That's my text here. Father, I pray that you would breathe on your word this morning. Consider your servant of Vessel of honor, O oh God, worthy to be used by you this morning. Most gracious and merciful God, have your way. Give to us what we need to receive this morning through your word, O oh God. Let your word come forth with power, with clarity, and with authority. This we ask you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So my topic this morning is a spiritual dilemma. A spiritual dilemma. Every spiritual dilemma requires a spiritual response. Not just God to respond, but we have to respond as well. So the biblical account of creation not only shed light on who God is, but it also provides insight into the relationship he has with his creation. The biblical narrative affords us the opportunity to glean insights into the mind of God and his methods and the agencies that he uses to accomplish his will. It is important to distinguish God from his works and from his attributes and what he does. Because who he is, is worthy alone. He doesn't have to do anything. Because he's God, he's worthy of our worship. He is worthy of us to submit ourselves to him. Because he's God. He's God, he's God. And therefore, he is. It is his godness that is, hang on, let me get this right. His godness is not a result of his power and his attributes, but rather his power and attributes are the result of his godness. So he is God all by himself. He has no rivals. He has no equals. He is unmatched, unparalleled. He is God. Somebody shout, he's God. He is the chief designer of our universe. He orchestrated and he is the architect of the universe. All life and all life systems. He is the author and the progenitor of it all. There is no life, no substance, no thing able to exist without him first causing it to exist. So he doesn't need anyone's approval. And the fact that he is the creator of life and the creator of the universe means that he doesn't need to seek anyone's approval. He doesn't need your approval, you to like me, to, for him to bless me. Amen. He doesn't need the permission of the angels before he takes action. He doesn't run his decisions through a committee. He's sovereign. All by himself. He stands alone by himself. Self-sufficient God. He doesn't need my praise. I need my praise. Because praise opens doors for me. Praise brings him to me. He doesn't need angels and our praise. He's God all by himself. The self-sustaining one. This God steps into our situation. And he doesn't step into our situation empty-handed. He brings with him the ability to fix things, to turn things around, to make things new, to bring life where there was death, to bring light to where there was darkness. He gives order and structure to you. Plans and purposes, he adds to it and sustains it. Not only does he create, he sustains what he creates. And I'm his creation. You're his creation. And the fact that we're still here means that he's going to continue to provide everything that we need that pertains to life and to godliness. All that we need, he will provide. So he's God. And he works all things according to the counsel of his will. He makes something out of nothing. He makes ways out of no ways. The Hebrew call it bara. It means to create something where nothing existed. He didn't need any raw materials. 
He didn't need any DNA, X or Y chromosomes. He didn't need anything to create this world that we live in. He spoke it into existence and it became what he said it would become. Bara. So this tells us that we are dealing with somebody who cannot be contained. This is somebody who is superior and he is supreme. He's God. And the fact that he's God all by himself, he can decree a thing into existence. Now watch this. The scripture shows us that the the reason why, why we're looking at this Genesis text here and why we're looking at the context of how this all happens is because we serve a personal God. And he shows us the consistency of his character and why we can place our hope and our trust and our confidence in him. Because as I stated, what he creates, he sustains. And what he starts, he finishes. And until God says it's over, it's never over. I will never be defeated. I will never be downtrodden. I will never be dismayed. Because until God says it's over, it ain't over. And if God lives, I'm going to live. Christ Temple, I want to tell you this morning, as I was praying this morning, the Spirit of the Lord, this is what he told me as I was consulting the Lord about what to say and how to say it. He told me to tell you that the devil's active strategy is to sow seeds of discouragement and to cast a stream of doubt. I mean, a wave, a barrage, attack after attack, thought after thought, demonic plot after demonic plot, a series of attacks, mental and spiritual attacks. And he's going to do it relentlessly in this season to cause the people of God to stumble and waver while you're waiting on the Lord to bring his promises to pass. While you're waiting for him to bring the promise to pass, be patient, be watchful, be vigilant, because the attacks are going to come and they're going to come from your mind. They're going to come from places where you least expect it. They may even come from friends and with family members, from people that you love dearly. That just might be the vehicle that the enemy uses to try to get you off target, to try to knock you off focus. So be vigilant. This devil wants to undermine your confidence. He doesn't want you to gain any consistency in your walk with the Lord. Every time you decide that you're going to pursue and you're going to lock in and I'm going to read my word, I'm going to set a day to fast, I'm going to be all that God calls me to be. That's when the attacks start to come. That's when they don't stop. It's relentless. And that's the spiritual dilemma that we're in. Now, how are we going to respond? Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are strong and mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The scriptures even tells us that every thought that that erects itself above the knowledge of Jesus Christ, we have the power, we have the access, we have the ability to bring it under subjection. You don't have to have these thoughts lingering in your mind. You don't have to live with the enemy tormenting you. You don't have to play these games with these devils. Lock in. Get your weapons of our warfare. The armies of the Lord, we are here. That's who we are. We're living in the last days. We can't take a passive approach to our spirituality. That's a kingdom at stake. The harvest is ripe. Where's the laborers? God, I want to have a mindset to be a laborer. I want to have a mindset to go after and go get it, to be in the pursuit of it, God. God, I want you to show me which way I should go. God, I want you to show me who I should bless. God, I want you to show me your power. 
don't want to make myself available to you. I don't want to sit on the sidelines and talking about the other people and what they doing and how they did it. I want to get in the flow myself. I want to experience God myself. I want to be delivered myself. I want to be healed myself. I want to see my family blessed. I want to see my community blessed. This ain't routine has to stop. We've got to shake ourselves out of our comfort zone and out of this conveniency that we live ourselves in. This is the age of conveniency. If it ain't convenient, I don't want it. If it ain't convenient, I don't want to go after it. What kind of mindset is that? They that wait on the Lord. What? Somebody help me finish it. Knew their strength. Shall. Shall. So when the enemy starts chirping and whispering in your ear, you remind that devil of the promises of God. You remind that devil of the word of God. You remind yourself who you are in the Lord. You're not just a woman. You're not just a little girl. You're not just a man. You're a child of God. You got power. He died to give you the power. He got pierced in his side and nails in his feet to give you the power. He took a crown of thorns on his head and hung on a tree for hours to give you the power. Think about that. For the joy that was set before the Lord, he endured the suffering of the cross. Why? Because he loves you and he knew that you was going to need power. He knew that you was going to need strength. And he needs a representation in the earth. You are made in the image and the likeness of God. The theologians call it the Imago Dei. That means you have all that God has in human form. The secret is we get out of order. We get out of order. And we start listening to things that we shouldn't be listening to that appeal to our flesh. If it appeals to our flesh... It stimulates our appetite for it. And that's why the, Paul said to crucify your flesh daily. Why would an apostle tell us that? Why would he tell us to crucify yourself daily? Because it's necessary. Because we're creatures of habit. And we crave comfort zones. See, we got to be stretched and put into some uncomfortable situations and circumstances and be adaptable and trusting God in the midst of what you don't understand, in the midst of what you might see. So we got work to do, people of God. Plenty of work to do. So the devil doesn't want us to gain any consistency in our walk with the Lord. And when we set our minds to do something, he wants to give us every rationale for why we shouldn't, why we can't, what I don't feel like doing right now. And then we give heed to it. We take the bait. And then, it, again, it breeds an environment of routine and conveniency. And these are all things that we know aren't pleasing to God. Amen. And some of you, some of us, the devil before you even discover, before you even get started, is trying to abort you. God has given vision, business plans, creative, creative thought, 
But we listen to the enemy discouraging us and casting doubt, and we talk ourselves out of doing something before we even get started. That's the satanic attack, Christ Temple. Be on the lookout for it, Christ Temple. We're in the second, third week of January, Christ Temple. Our goal here is to repair, to restore, and to reconnect. Christ Temple, the devil doesn't want you to repair. The devil doesn't want you to restore. The devil does not want you to reconnect. He wants you to be comfortable. He wants you to be routine. How are you going to respond to this spiritual dilemma? Before you commit your ways to the Lord, you're sitting here in confusion and worried on if I'm going to be able to do it. The devil is a lie. That's his job. To roam to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. What's he devouring? Potential. Talent. Your anointing. Took the word right out of my mouth. Your anointing. Value your anointing. Value the oil. Don't be like the brother who preferred the soup over his birthright because he was fatigued. Fatigued. And felt Overly exhausted when it was just a temporary setback. Don't make a long-term exchange of your anointing behind a temporary relationship or a temporary circumstance or a temporary setback. The anointing will bless you, your children's children, generational wealth, generational healing, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life if you just pursue the Lord. I don't care if it looks more prosperous over there. I don't care if the grass looks greener over there. I'm going to trust God and I'm going to stay the course. That's the mindset that we have to have, people of God. That's the mindset that we have to maintain. So before you commit your ways to him and discover your divine purpose, before you even discover the call of God on your life, as many of us know that there's a call of God in our life, but for whatever reason, we've talked ourselves out of why we didn't step in it fully. Now look at the text. It says that the, te- the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field that the Lord made. He's cunning. He's crafty. He's sneaky. And he's sinister. That's the devil. Okay? That's who he is. And his agenda is, again... To deceive you, to make you think it's all good, it's all well and, it's all well and good. There's no long-term impact to your disobedience. You can, still, you can still go to church and still be, you can still participate in this stuff and still get your shout on. Don't nobody see. What did Isaiah 29, 14 say? That they think their plans are, dis- are, 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 that they're hiding them from me. That's what this says. Isaiah, the same scripture that we wrote, read this morning, it talks about people thinking they can masquerade and hide their truest intention from God. While coming to church, while paying tithes and giving offerings and singing in the choir and preaching and doing whatever else. Harboring plans of deception, all while participating in the things of God. That's the Bible, y'all. I'm not preaching at anybody. I'm just saying what Bible is. <laughs> Amen. So, what are the things show us? 
The narrative shows us, I got 15 more minutes. The narrative shows us that we are all, all of us, endowed with freedom and a capacity for self-direction. We are all endowed from God with freedom and a capacity for self-direction, which can make us susceptible to deception, self-sabotage, and destructive outcomes and patterns of behavior. So we all have this freedom, this willpower, this ability to make decisions. And God respects him. But he also, he's accountable and he's holy and he will reinforce his standards. He will keep you accountable and he's held to his word. So he's going to do right. He's a loving God. He's a forgiving God. But he will keep you accountable. And it's rightfully so. The people of God Real pastors and real men and women of God will preach the truth, the unadulterated word of God, to keep themselves and the flock of God accountable to this standard. That's what the true calling is of a pastor, of a man of God, anybody preaching this word. is to be true to the text, true to the standard, and preach the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And what is good and acceptable will of God? And we have to have an appetite for it. We have to hunger and a thirst for it. We can't grow numb to it and become bored. And I've heard this and I've read this. The Lord still hasn't returned. It's been 2,500 years. Things is just getting passive. The devil is a lie. We can't grow too convenient, too complacent. With this freedom comes responsibility. And we can choose to give glory to God. To conform our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions with his ways. Or we can take the freedom that he gave us and the ability to make our own decisions. And we can choose to go down a path of self-gratification and therefore be enslaved to our selfish ambition, our vices, and our impulses. And those impulses are designed to bring you into bondage and to keep you into bondage. Those impulses are designed to break your fellowship with God. If the enemy can step in and break your fellowship with God, but introduce habits and impulses that keep you in a perpetual cycle of disobeying God and just falling victim to your flesh, the devil is a lie. There is power available to break the cycle. And there's some cycles that need to be broken. There's some habits that need to be broken. There's some patterns that need to be broken. The text also shows us that God placed man into a place of pleasure. That's what Eden is. Eden in the Hebrew means a place of pleasure. So why did God put all of these access to this abundance and access to all of these different things and put the tree of life and the knowledge of good and evil all in the same space so that man had access to it? Why did he do it? Why did he put man in a place of pleasure? Because he wants to show man how to have boundaries. And how to have healthy boundaries. How you can't just have everything that you you want. There's got to be some limitations and some structure, some order, some things that you submit yourself to. You submit yourself to God. And then the power and the influence that God has given you, he multiplies it. And now you are balanced because you bring yourself under his rulership, under his subjection, under his authority. And the blessing that God has given you, the oversight that God has given you, he will keep it in order. Because we all have leadership ability and responsibility. You don't have to be a man. You don't have to be a a husband. You don't have to necessarily be a wife. As a child of God, there are obligations that are inherent in who you are as a child, as a believer. So we all have leadership ability and leadership responsibility. So we have to participate. Now watch this. 
When you are in a place of pleasure and abundance, boundaries are healthy. Not having boundaries is toxic. And a false balance is an abomination before the Lord. So we have to anticipate opposition in the place of abundance and opportunity. So if God brings you into a place of abundance and opportunity, you have to just know in the same place where this opportunity is, is going to be some opposition. Where is it going to manifest? We have to anticipate it. That's what the text is showing us, number one. Number two, it's showing us in order for us to reach the fullest of our potential, we have to exercise self-restraint. It is not an option. It's non-negotiable. We have to do it. Self-restraint. Number three, we have to be adept at trusting God even when he chooses not to disclose all of the details. Adept at trusting God when he conceals information. Trust him anyway. That's how Eve and Adam got us in this predicament here. Because they didn't have all of the information. And they pursued it a perverted manner. They should have waited and trusted God. And this is where you use the weapon of praise against the enemy in those moments where he's bombarding your mind and your thinking, flooding you with doubt and flooding you with discouragement. This is where you pull out the weapon of praise. Because praise reminds you who God is. If you get defeated, or even if for a moment, if you get discouraged, you're not feeling as on fire as you used to, start praising God. Start acknowledging him. Open up your mouth and extol him. Open up your mouth and magnify the name of the Lord. Exalt him. And guess what happens? He'll start bringing the images. He'll start revealing things to you. He'll start showing you ways on what he's getting ready to do. He'll start reminding you of things that he's done in the past. He'll give you a snapshot of your future. And in the midst of praising God, while the enemy is throwing his tax and bombarding you, you start feeling strength. You start feeling joy. You start feeling excitement and energy. You start expecting God to do it. You start thanking him in advance. You start thanking him in advance for the deliverance. You start thanking him in advance for the solution. You start thanking him in advance for the job. You start thanking him in advance for the house. You start thanking him in advance for the spouse. In advance. Even if he chooses not to tell you. Lord, I know you're going to do it anyway. Because it's in your nature to be good. There is none like you, oh God. There is none besides you, Lord God. You are above and not beneath. You are the head and not the tail. If you spoke it, you surely bring it to pass. So I'm going to wait, Lord. And I'm going to stand still. I'm going to trust. I'm going to pursue. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to give up. I might get weary, but I won't throw in the towel. I won't quit. I might need a breath. I might need somebody to pick me up, but I'm not going to quit on God. I'm not going to quit on my destiny. I'm not going to quit on my future. I'm not going to quit on my family. I'm not going to quit on my anointing. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Use your weapons of our warfare. They're not carnal, they're mighty, strong and mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Some things that have been stubborn in your life seem like you just can't shake it, huh? seem like you just can't get a kick of it, huh? but God will break it. He will break it. You provide the faith. He'll provide the breakthrough. (laughs) 
So you got to remind yourself when you're under attack and when you feel confused and you don't know which way to go, praise him. And in the midst of praising him, you start thinking like, my God, you got all power in your hands. That's what you show me in this text. If I read it, I see that you are the God that can create ways out of no ways, God. And if my dilemma looks crazy, there's nothing compared to the chaos and to the crisis that you created when you created this universe. So there is no thing that is too hard for our God. There is no crisis that is too big to intimidate him. He says, bring it to me. All you that are heavy laden, if you need rest, bring it to me. You got problems? Bring it to me. I can give you peace. I can give you rest. I can give you stability. And the things that we should be asking God for, believing God for, pursuing God for, sometimes we try to pursue it and look for it in people. We try to look for it in relationships. We try to look for it through inappropriate sexual relationships, voids that are in our hearts, voids that are in our minds. We give it all to other places, but bring it all to Jesus. Bring it all to Jesus. He ain't intimidated by it. He ain't gonna look at you sideways. He gonna show up. He gonna step into it. He gonna show out. He gonna break it. He gonna show himself to be strong. Strong and mighty. Mighty in battle. Everything that he says, everything that he is, steps into it when he step into it. Everything. He brings everything to take care of the problem and meet the need. Nothing is too hard for our God. I don't care what you come up with. I don't care how big the issue looks. Bring it to Jesus. Bring it to Jesus. Gather your thoughts, gather your items, and bring it to Jesus. Almost done, (laughs) y'all. Praise him. And I know praise in our apostolic circuits. Praise is a thing. It's a commonplace. Don't allow it to be so familiar that you forget about the true essence of why you have the weapon of praise. Because it reminds you that he's omnipotent. He's all-knowing. He's not shocked. He's never surprised. There ain't no thing that you face in your life that will ever shock God. And there was never a challenge that he couldn't meet. And then you're praising him. You start thinking about the ableness of God. And you get your heart and your mind in a place where I don't care about the circumstances. I don't care about what's going on. I just want to soak in your presence, oh God. And I just want to dwell. I just want to dwell, God. I just want to be in your presence. Because your ableness would then rub off on me. And I'm reminded of how good you are. I'm reminded of how powerful you are. And my problem shrinks when my praise goes up. It literally happens. I got to close. But one thing I want you to know is God is personal. And he desires personal communion and relationship. He does not want fake, phony, shallow worship. He desires truth in the inward part. So keep it a hundred. Keep it a buck. If you line up today, and if there's a need in your life, whatever it is, 
trust no nothing absolutely nothing that's how confident i am in god there is nothing too hard and even if he decides not to I'm not going to get discouraged. I'm not going to get defeated. I remember praying and asking God, Lord, help my mama. Help when she was on her sick bed. Help her to get a new liver. God, show up. Step in. Many of us have known somebody that has lost their life to COVID. I lost two cousins. And the pastor, we, 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 when we was in Texas, COVID. I had COVID. Back in January last year, Michaela, Jasmine, we got through it. Many of you may have had it, got through it. Some died. I remember praying for Sister Tracy, her dad, the week prior to him passing away, trusting and believing in God, and his will was done. I'm not going to get defeated. Don't you get weary. Don't you get discouraged because God doesn't turn it around when you think he should turn it around when you want him to turn it around. Trust him anyway. Obey anyway. Because when you don't, you open up yourself to problems that you then need God to dip, bail you out on. So bring him to Jesus. I got more message, but I got to stop. I want to be sensitive to time, but I want to minister. And I want you guys to be open to receiving from the Lord this morning. So elders, men and women of God, let's rally around the people of God with needs and let's touch heaven.